March 2021 welcomes the 40th anniversary of what could have been seen as an almost impossible computer. It was more advanced and incredibly less expensive than its predecessor, which was already one of the only computers you could buy for under £100. That machine was of course the incredibly successful ZX80, and on the 5th of March 1981, a machine was released that changed the face of computing in Britain, and finally put computing power in the hands of, well, almost anyone. Let's take a look at the Sinclair ZX81. Nineteen eighty-one was a very newsworthy year, from the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer to the assassination attempt on Pope John Paul II, the inauguration of Ronald Reagan as U.S. President, the launch of MTV, Muhammad Ali's retirement, the Brixton riots. The list goes on and on. And in amongst all of this, the ZX eighty-one, produced by Sinclair Research and launched in March to a market hungry for access to emerging microcomputers and almost single-handedly launched the mass market for home software and computer peripherals in the UK. The machine went on to sell over 1.5 million units in its lifetime, and despite its somewhat limited capabilities, still managed some amazing achievements. At the time, popular machines like the Apple II Plus and the TRS-80 would have set you back £550 and £399 respectively, at a time when the average weekly wage in Britain was £140 for men, and much lower for women, it was a less enlightened time. And this meant that a computer was a significant investment, a month's wage for an Apple II Plus. Even the Acorn Atom, another very successful home computer in the early 80s, and the forerunners of the BBC Micro, was £140 in kit form, and over £170 to buy already assembled. So. When Sinclair announced the ZX81 would retail at £49 for the kit, and only £69 fully assembled, well, finally a computer was within reach for less than a week's wages. And it sold. So let's take a look inside this original Issue 1 machine, purchased as faulty or not working from eBay, and see if we can get the old girl going again. Along the way, we'll learn a little bit about what makes the machine tick, some of the peculiarities that make the system unique, and ultimately, get her looking as good as new. Finally, all being well, we'll take a look at just what could be achieved in only 1k of RAM. These really are tiny machines, and it's amazing to think that people used to run successful businesses entirely on one of these little tykes. We need to take a good look on the inside before we power on for the first time, to check for any visible damage, especially as this machine was sold as faulty. If there are any loose or damaged parts, it's better to catch them now before they've sent nasty electricity flying around the board and frying everything. We can get a good feeling for how the machine has been stored by looking for moisture or other damage at this stage. Five screws hold the machine together and then it's off with the back. With the back removed, we can see there really isn't much to these machines at all. And look at all the wavy lines, the indicator of an issue one machine with the hand-drawn traces. The bottom of the motherboard looks good, although we will need to inspect it thoroughly for dry and bad joints. There are two more screws that hold the motherboard to the top of the case, so let's whip those off too. The keyboard is of the membrane variety, with two somewhat fragile ribbons that plug into the mainboard. We'll need to delicately remove those as even though we'll replace the keyboard anyway for aesthetic reasons, this may be a usable keyboard for testing purposes. Flipping the board over, we can instantly see how Sinclair had managed to produce this board so cheaply. There are only four chips, replacing the 21 chips on the ZX80. And the reason for this was the uncommitted logic array, or ULA chip, designed by Jim Westwood and manufactured by Ferranti. This single chip replaced 18 of the chips on the ZX80, reducing costs significantly. The ULA was responsible for input and output to cassette storage, synchronizing the screen display, reading the keyboard, generating the clock signals, and various other tasks. The Z80 processor remained unchanged from the previous model and still ran at 3.25 MHz. And unfortunately, this combined with the nature of the ULA 
meant that one of the original quirks of the ZX80, the screen flickering at each key press, was still evident in hardware. This was due to the machine not having enough power to maintain the screen display as well as monitoring other system events at the same time. To get around this on the ZX81, the ROM introduced fast and slow modes. Ironically, the fast mode was basically the same as the ZX80 and sacrificed the display integrity to allow the CPU to run as fast as it could. The new slow mode, meanwhile, ran the CPU at a quarter of its original speed to allow the display to remain unaffected. This was known as compute and display mode and was a great way to make a feature out of a hardware quirk. The ROM increased in size from 4K on the ZX80 to a whopping 8K on the ZX81 and provided floating point calculations along with other software improvements and the previously mentioned slow mode. In actual fact, both machines were so similar that the upgraded ROM of the ZX81 could be fitted to the ZX80 and with a few additional mods, the ZX80 could be fully upgraded to a ZX81 very easily. This effort to keep costs low meant that Sinclair pushed as much as possible into the ULA and ended up overworking it, causing it to run very hot. This, coupled with the heatsink on the power regulator, caused a lot of internal heat buildup and failing components. For example, the ribbon cable on our machine is showing heat damage from the heatsink. Our measly 1K of memory is sitting here, and to put that in perspective, let's break down what we really have to play with. A full screen of text would take up 793 bytes, so best to use the screen area sparingly. System variables take up another 125 bytes. Add in your program and other system uses for memory, and well, basically, you don't have much to play with. While we're inside the machine, we'll change these caps out too, just in case. A close-up inspection of the board tells us that she's in pretty good cosmetic condition, so we'll attempt to quick power up. I'll use a nice modern power supply, 9 volts and centre positive, unlike the Spectrum. Well, that's not a good sign, is it? That's the best signal I can get at this point, but at least I am getting a signal. Now, the good thing about the ZX81 is there's not a lot that can go wrong, so let's be systematic and do some checks. Firstly, let's check we're getting the right voltages across the board and to all of the chips. Checking the input voltage at the socket, we're reading just under 9 volts, which is fine as the board is under load. That 9 volts is making it to the regulator input, and we have nearly 5 volts coming out of the regulator, so that's all fine too. So let's check that the chips are receiving their 5 volts too, starting with the ULA, which looks good. The ROM is also getting 5 volts, as is the RAM. Pin 11 on the Z80 carries the voltage, so let's just check that. And we can see that's good too, so no problems with any voltages getting to the chips. Taking an even closer look at the board, we can see that there are a couple of scratches that go across several traces, so let's quickly test continuity across those traces to eliminate that as an issue. Okay, so continuity isn't a problem. So what do we think the likely candidate here is? Well, remember that these machines are 40 years old and things have changed a bit since then. We've developed standards for video signals, for example. These Issue 1 ULAs didn't generate what is known as a back porch signal. Essentially, the video waveform produced by this ULA doesn't comply with the standards defined for modern televisions. The timing is out and the signal lacks a number of controls. This can cause modern TVs to display the signal as a very dark or almost black picture. We can test this by replacing this old ULA with a more modern replacement, such as this VLA81 from ZX Renew, which made no difference whatsoever. So next on the agenda will be to swap out the Z80, as I have a few of those lying around that I know are in good shape. So let's remove the old one with my trusty massive flat bladed screwdriver 
please don't roast me in the comments. This is my tool of choice for this processor on this board. It works a treat. So we'll just pop in this fresh Z80 and then give the old girl another go. So let's get ready to shout happy birthday Mrs ZX81. And yes, she lives. Happy 40th birthday. Just going to type in the obligatory hello world. And the keyboard's working just fine. So with the machine now working, let's sort out those few cosmetic issues, starting with the keyboard which we need to replace because as well as new keyboards looking all lovely and clean, the ribbon cables are badly worn and have suffered from a bit of heat damage. New keyboards are readily available. This one I got from eBay for about £15. Removing the old keyboard is a simple matter of finding an edge and peeling it off. It may leave a sticky residue but we'll get rid of that with some isopropyl alcohol later. Peeling this off was deeply satisfying. Underneath looks really clean. I'm wondering if this keyboard has already been replaced at some point in the machine's life. So now it's time for an 80s style washing and scrubbing montage. I think that's quite enough of that. Honestly, we're a respectable channel, you know. The new keyboard pops straight in. Just make sure that there's no leftover adhesive and you're good to go. Take care when doing this as it's very sticky, so make sure you're lined up really nicely before the adhesive sticks. Okay, that looks good. Now let's put the rest back together before taking a look at what you can do in 1K. And unfortunately, the answer is simply not much. Most people ended up buying the dreaded 16k RAM pack of Doom, which had a tendency to wobble and lose all of your hard typed efforts, just as you thought, I'd better save this and go and have my dinner. But there is 1k chess. Whilst it's missing some of the rules of chess, including en passant, castling and promotion, it's an amazing achievement, fitting AI chess in 672 bytes. This was a record that this game held for 20 years. You may be interested to know that the current world record holder is Lean Chess, which is coded in only 288 bytes. Amazing. And unfortunately, there's not a lot else for the unexpanded ZX81 that would make you want to buy one. If there's enough interest, I might just take on the installation of this 32K internal memory upgrade and then revisit the machine in a later episode. Let me know in the comments. In the meantime though, let's enjoy this little slice of retro heaven, all lovingly back to full working order. And even if there's nothing we can really do with it at this point, it's a piece of computing history that I'm proud to own. I hope you've enjoyed this look back at this tiny, cheap little computer, without which we'd arguably be in a different world today. And as always, thanks for watching. Please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to be notified of new content. As always, please leave your comments below, we always like to read them. And until next time in the shack, it's goodbye from me.